Hi friends, thanks so much for joining us tonight as we begin this spring semester series of Integritas Forums. These interview style conversations are intended to provide you, our Soren Fellows, opportunities to hear from and engage with successful professionals from a wide range of sectors, be it healthcare, engineering, the nonprofit space, even about religious, about their experiences and reflections on maintaining personal and ethical integrity across their professional, familial, and faith lives. These conversations will range from considerations on work-life balance, growing in the faith after college, vocational discernment in family life, and practical insight into professional development. The inspiration for this recurring event is really twofold. In all that we do through the Soren Fellows Program, we seek to elevate the relational character of your formation and resist the reductively transactional paradigm so characteristic of modern university education. These conversations are intended to allow you to get to know and learn from someone rather than learn something or some abstract set of ideas apart from personal narrative. And as you well know, the De Nicola Center is proudly a scholarly center at a research university, but we also recognize and embrace that the majority of students we engage through the Soren Fellows Program will not have careers bound to academia or the university, but rather will be scattered across a variety of public and private enterprises, whether through finance, medicine, research, law, engineering, and the like. Many of you will also be moms or dads, husbands or wives, good friends and counselors, community leaders, clergy, or religious. In the relational spirit of the center, we hope these conversations provide you opportunities to glean practical advice and enduring insight from persons who display virtues of truly integral formation, whether they work in the field you hope to enter, have a similar vocational path, or not. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, these conversations would best take place in person over LaCroix and Rocco's Pizza, which, of course, we plan on moving forward once our shared life together regains some normalcy. But in the interim, we will host these online, which will allow you to access and revisit this content at your own leisure, whether in your dorm room or on a walk around campus. The format of these conversations will be as follows. I'll interview our guest for about 30 minutes or so, covering topics from professional advice to personal discernment and everything in between. Then we'll be joined live by our guests so he or she can field questions from Soren Fellows that arose out of our conversation, and that'll run for about 20 minutes or so. With that said, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our guest this evening, who, for many of our Soren Fellows, is already a good friend and mentor. Susie Younger is a certified fertility care practitioner in a hospital-based program where she assists couples in learning the Creighton Model Fertility Care System. Professionally, she supports couples in practicing natural family planning, assists those trying to conceive, offers medical alternatives to contraception, and teaches women of all ages how to be active participants in monitoring, preserving, and or restoring their gynecologic and procreative health. Susie is a longtime member of the Notre Dame and De Nicola Center community. She serves as the coordinator of marriage preparation through campus ministry and is very active within the De Nicola Center, both as a faculty member for the Vita Institute, the center's intensive summer intellectual formation program for leaders in the national and international pro-life movement, and through leading one of my favorite Soren Fellows programs, Vocation to Love, a weekly women's discussion group exploring questions of identity in light of our Christian faith and contemporary pro-life feminism. I would highly encourage any Soren Fellow women interested in these themes or just access to holy, joyful community of fellow pilgrims on the journey to join VTL. Susie is also a frequent lecturer on campus, pre preparing Master of Divinity students, seminarians, future physicians, and the general student population to better understand the theology and biology behind the church's teaching on marriage and family planning. At home, Susie and her husband, Dave, a fellow Notre Dame employee, are parents to three wonderful children gifted to them by God through adoption. As Susie says, she, quote, strives to keep her sanity and sense of humor amidst the many demands of marriage, motherhood, and homeschooling, and looks for ways to sanctify the daily grind so that she and her family may live each day with greater faith, joy, and holiness. I can't really think of a better segue to our conversation than that. Well, Susie, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this conversation. And for many of our Soren Fellows and for a lot of us here at the Center, um, you're no one new. You're an old friend of the Center and you do so much for us through the Vita Institute and through Vocation to Love and even with other students on campus through the MDiv program. But thank you for taking time out of your, your very busy schedule to share with us a little bit about yourself, your life and your family tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Susie, for those who don't know you, uh, those will be a minimal amount of our Soren Fellows, whether it was through the Holy Land pilgrimage that you helped to be a faculty member on or through VTL. Could you just share with us a little bit about your, yourself, um, uh, your, your family, where you're from, what your current life looks like in all its complex glory? 
Yeah, sure. That that's a really good phrase. All my complex glory. I usually describe our life as chaotic, you know, mess on the way to holiness. But I I like complex <laughs> glory. That that's the hope of the future, right? Um, so I I was born and raised in Indiana. I've uh, moved around quite a bit um, since college. Uh, actually, met my husband Dave in Austria uh, at the baggage claim. So if you want to talk about unlikely places to meet your future spouse, um, uh, and so I met him in Vienna. Uh, when we were working for Franciscan University's of Steubenville Study Abroad program. So he was the male residence director. I was the female residence director. We had an office about this size um, where we, in essence, were mom and dad to about 160 students each semester. Yeah. And so it was a beautiful way for us to uh, discern marriage, you know, for, for our dating and our courtship. Um, because we were in essence almost running a trial of life, right? Like discipline and um, budgeting and things like that. And uh, yeah, it was wonderful building community. Um, and so we loved living over there. We loved working with the program. We still love all things international. Uh, my husband is actually uh, one of the associate directors uh, here at NDI uh, with study abroad. So some, some of you might know him as well. Um, but we moved back to the States mainly because we knew we wanted to get married um, and we wanted to finish up that discernment of our marriage in the culture mm. in which we would live. We knew we wouldn't live overseas. Mm. So, so we came back to really fully discern um, our call to marriage in the culture in which we would live. Um, got married in 2006. So we'll celebrate 15 years of marriage here coming up in July. Awesome. It went by very quickly. <laughs> um, and then we have three children. Um, we have actually carried the cross of infertility through our entire marriage. Uh, and so we now have uh, three children through the gifts of adoption. And so we've done foster care, we've done um, closed adoption, open adoption, agency, private. Um, so a little bit of everything. So that's, yeah, a little bit about us. Amazing. Thank you, Susie. Yes. And you're a family of skiers, right? I mean, I, oh, I, we're friends on Facebook, right? So I, I yeah. see skiing <laughs> everywhere. Did that come out of Austria times, or did, did you grow up with that? that? Actually how did, how did that happen? Austria. So I okay. started oh, wow. skiing when I was probably two or three, if I remember correctly. Oh, um, my my father taught me the love of the sport, mm. um, and my grandparents actually skied as well. So my grandfather mm. skied until he was ninety four. So I grew up in the winter. That's what you did. Like three generations went skiing together for weeks, you know, a week on end or a weekend. Um, and it just was always such a wonderful way to build family because mm. you're on the chairlift a lot and you have time to talk and you're sitting over cocoa and your hands are too cold to get, well, we didn't have cell phones back then, but you know, your hands are too cold to get your cell phone out and you're really bonding. And I, and so I wanted to share that with our children. Um, Dave didn't quite pick up the skiing vibe, but he stays home and watches babies when they're napping. He has dinner ready, you know, like it works. It's a mutual win, win. Gifts. It win, is a win, win. win. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, we started Absolutely. the kids. They were 16 months, 18 months. Yeah. One of those two when they started and they're so great. going strong. So great. It's Absolutely. a great way to redeem the winter, you know, instead of cursing this uh, permacloud we live in, it's just, we're always active and winter just flies by for us. So. I have, I have something to learn from that. I'm just going to take a mental note there. Um, <laughs> you can come just enjoy the opera she yeah. after, after COVID's passed. Absolutely. Come enjoy the ski Absolutely. Lunch vibes, Absolutely. So. Love it. Love it. Well, Susie, uh, you alluded to the fact that part of your and Dave's story um, in, in your marriage has been carrying the cross of infertility. Um, also, your professional work, though, I mean, you, you work with couples yeah. with respect to natural family planning. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us a little bit about your professional background in, in, that, in yeah. that work? Um, and, and also kind of use that maybe at, the, at, at some point to tease out a little bit of, of where your personal story and your professional life begin to intersect and how they kind of mutually refine one another. Sure. So my undergraduate degrees were in economics, German and business management. <laughs> and I laugh because I'm not doing anything with any of those true, like specifically, they've all formed me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I still have interest in all of them, but at, my career development is a bit unusual and that I never felt drawn to climb the corporate ladder. I never, mm. I, I never felt that pressure to go and be somebody and to make, you know, make a name for myself in essence. What was more important to me was to pursue the passions and to be mm. available for wherever God led me. So mm. where this led me after college, I had um, job offers, London, Chicago, you know, big consulting firms. Um, and I turned it down and I taught high school German for, I think it was $11,000 a year, my first year out of college. So um, I mean, no, I might've been a little bit more than that, but because the only reason I know that 
is for the next two consecutive jobs that I took, I actually took a pay cut every time I moved jobs. And wow. people were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm following my passions and I'm happy and I'm cared for. And, and I have that work-life balance that I desired. So um, foray in international admissions. Um, so I, I love teaching mm -hmm. German. Um, but when I came back to the States after Austria, there weren't any German teaching positions available. So I worked in uh, college admissions at three different universities for the time. Um, I did my master's in language education, focusing on German again, no German jobs. Um, and, and really was in admissions until our own story of infertility and trying to get answers for our underlying health conditions, um, led us to learn about Creighton model fertility care system, NAPRO technology, the medical component. Um, and at the time we were, we just moved here, this was in 2008. And there was one physician trained in NAPRO but not really doing a whole lot. And so for me, it was so important to me as a woman and to my own empowerment, understanding of my body, helping heal, uh, move towards our dream of building a family. Um, and, and the more I learned about it, I thought I have to help bring this here because we didn't, there was just this void. We had all of the right pieces in our community, but nothing had been brought together to build yet. And so that's really where I've spent the majority you know, of my last 10 plus years um, has been in building the practice that's now St. Joe OBGYN um, over at the hospital in Mishawaka. So that started out as my private practice. And then I did, my parents were so proud. I did use my business management degree, <laughs> you know, and, and helped form the practice, recruit the physicians, build the infrastructure um, along with the business development uh, folks over there. So that's what I've been doing. I work um, about 10 hours a week doing natural family planning and, and education. Um, I'm, I homeschool our kids. So we have a fifth grader, a second grader, and a very strong-willed preschooler that I'm hoping it's leadership potential. That's why I can cling <laughs> to this, this strong will is leadership potential, and he's not going to turn to the dark side. But um, so we did that. And then actually last year, uh, an opportunity presented itself to work within campus ministry here on campus. So that's where we are now is in my, my office in Coleman Morse, and I do marriage preparation. So I I love, I get to breathe with both lungs now. I get to yeah. breathe with the marriage preparation lung and the natural family planning lung. And I just, it's a beautiful relationship when you put it all together, so. Yeah, I, I love that intersection of your familiarity and literacy with respect to natural family planning and working with couples, but then also working with uh, couples-to-be, uh, those who are mm -hmm. engaged um, in a way that, you know, you're able to offer them the gift of, of what they might uh should expect in some sense and especially illuminate things that they might not expect. Um, it kind of gets like, I mean, it, it strikes me like a, an interesting question then for you would, would be like, you know, um, in light of, gosh, your personal story, your professional expertise in NAPRO, um, your work with uh, engaged couples in marriage prep, like what, what advice would you give to Soren fellows, guys and girls alike, mm -hmm. um, who like anticipate marriage, they, they, it's, it's clear in their discernment uh, that, that marriage and family life is, is something that, that they're being called to, um, you know, and, and these are persons ultimately who are going to have to navigate questions and maybe even perhaps like unexpected uncertainties, um, yeah. uh, like what like you have in living out their vocations. What would you encourage or what do you encourage um, couples to think about or talk about that they might not otherwise kind of nat naturally be, be drawn to, to ask? I think a lot, by the time they get to be engaged, they've asked a lot of the questions. And if there's a disagreement or disparity of opinion, they're pretty much aware of it. Um, I think where I do the most of my counsel is in reminding them that that primary vocation is not to satisfy the other or be satisfied by the other, but truly our primary vocation is to love and for union with God. And that's what we're created for, right? I mean, that's where our, our group vocation to love create God its name. But so I think that has to be the focus even now, you know, as we're seeking a spouse, as we're dating, is to remember that our primary vocation is love and union with God. And, and we can only fulfill that when we make that complete and sincere gift of ourselves. And so I think we spend so much time focusing on trying to write, do the right fit that we run that risk of either settling, if you will, like trying to make a relationship fit because, well, it's not exactly what I want it to be, but it's close enough. You know, that that's, that's one bookend or one far end of the spectrum. And the other is like holding out for the perfect person. Like this person's not good. Enough. And so I think that's speaking more to the dating I see on campus. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're either settling and in a relationship far longer than we know we should be 
or or we're waiting and waiting and turning down you know options because we're waiting for that perfect person and i think that's where we have to remember that that grace comes in um you know we let god write the story and if you get too wedded to your own plans you're not available for for the lord to use you where he wants and when he wants and so i think as you develop your own holiness um and you grow in your own holiness your own identity then you seek to be faithful at every step of the way and God will bring that person right alongside with you. I love like the girls know <laughs> my Wednesday night girls. They know we talk about Rebecca a lot and how she watered the camels um, in the book of Genesis. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. I mean, camels are just sort of gross creatures, right? They spit, they stink, you know, but her job was to water the camels. And so she was faithful to what she was called to do. And in that moment, the Lord brought her spouse up alongside of her. So I think there has to be that balance between going and finding the person, like making it a, a task versus being open and, and realizing everybody's on a journey and, you know, we're, we're, we're still growing all of us. So. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks for sharing that, Susie. It, it resonates um, it, even with, with my own story and, and, and you're familiar with, with my story um, where it's like, uh, yeah, God is a God of surprises and, and there's, there's always a temptation to kind of master the nature around you such that you can kind of pursue your own ends unencumbered or at least control, uh, what, what, what you can control. Um, but, but the Lord just doesn't, doesn't always work in that way. You know, um, uh, he, he operates best in the space of humility. Um, and, and I think oftentimes in, in a very successful collegiate culture, say Notre Dame, uh, where, uh, through elementary school and through high school, there have been certain hoops and, and metrics that have been met. Um, it's easy for that kind of goal-based thinking to kind of permeate into the, the, the spiritual life and, and the life of discernment, uh, which can present obstacles. And, and Hugh even, yeah, discernment about finding a, a partner and a spouse and, and, and children. And I, I think in, in, in some sense, it presents certain difficulties then when you're faced with a cross that you can't solve. Um, oh, that sure. that there's there, there that there's no amount of quantitative rational thinking that'll allow you to kind of get through this this cross. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of want to bring that to light then um, in in the context of of your working with with couples, particularly young couples who who may be experiencing infertility. And and it's not something that that we would wish on on anyone, but yeah. I don't think it's unreasonable to to expect that that it will be the the story and a cross in Soren Fellow's lives. How do you work with those couples? How do you how do you counsel them, uh, both with respect kind of those those um, spiritual needs that are present in that, but also then kind of bringing to light certain like biological realities that they should be attentive to. Right, that's a good question. <laughs> Complex. I got it's like a lot to chew on in that oh. one. Um, you know, I think any aspect of our journey, any cross that we're ever asked to carry, it, it's not unique to infertility but it, it requires a tremendous level of obedience and faith and trust. And to understand that we're not promised everything will be happy, this sign of heaven, right? Like we, we all will carry a cross, but that cross can form us and not deform us. So we don't have to like it, but we do have an obligation to our creator to return that suffering back to him. And so what exactly does that look like? And I know for, for my own part, there was a time where, you know, the tears just would not stop in our journey. And, and I remember being at mass and going up to receive precious blood back when we were able to do that. It was so long ago, yeah. it seems, you know, and, and I remember just weeping and just saying spirit to the Lord, like, I will drink this cup for as long as you ask it of me, like, but let me have joy. Like, I just, I will carry the cross, but I don't want to be sorrowful. I don't want to be consumed. I don't want to be so focused on this that I'm unavailable to you, or I can't see the gifts that you're giving me because I'm only focusing, like, honestly, like my three-year-old focusing on the one thing I'm not getting that I'm not seeing. It. And it's not, mm. it's not to be flippant about the desiring of a child, right? A child is the supreme gift of marriage. Like we're, we're such, you know, proponents of the culture of life and rightly so like a child is in a far different league than a cookie that my, th my three-year-old was, <laughs> but yet the attitude's often the same, right? Like I want this and I'm mm -hmm. upset that I don't have it. And I'm going to try to keep working for it. And, and, and we are very good in this community about using our intellect to logically process, as you said. Good. And, and, and there's a phrase I use with my couples. I'm like, you will just sit and you will beat the head of your humanity against the heart of God's divinity. 
and you will try to make sense of it all. It's like mm. our human intellect is just, it's, I just envision like as a small child, just pounding my head against my Abba's chest and saying this, this doesn't make sense. And, and it doesn't like, right. Sufferings don't make sense, but can we return those back and say, but thy will be done, you yeah. know, like take this mm. redeem it. Um, I encourage them to spend a lot of time at the foot of the cross with our lady. Like if there's ever a, <clears throat> a an individual that could teach us to balance that human sorrow with supernatural joy definitely you know it, it is she um and so yeah i think yeah. trying to realize that we're all called again that vocation to love we're all called as women to motherhood we are all called as men to fatherhood and so that's not dependent upon any biological offspring that is a that is inherent part of our spirituality and i, I think especially in this year of saint joseph we have that opportunity mm -hmm. to look into what does that mean you know for men to be father right and for women what does that mean to be mother that it's not just yeah about changing diapers and midnight feedings and things like that you know we're, we're all called to care for the souls entrusted to us yeah. so mm -hmm. i think yeah. we focus a lot on that well well, never once denying that this hurts. It hurts yeah. a lot, you know, and, and, and again, that's not something that's just unique to infertility, right? It's the desire to get married and not finding a spouse, or it's not finding the job and the career that you were passionate about, or it's the death of a loved one. I think it's just learning about um, being peaceful. And I think, you know, Father Jacques Philippe pretty much pick up any one of his books. I think they're, they're so tiny, they pack such a punch. Yeah. Um, yeah, We've got to that, invite him back. Yeah, we, please, we, because yeah, I didn't make back. it to a single event when we you were here, oh, and I am, okay. I've been kicking myself ever since. <laughs> once, once uh, COVID uh, yes. uh, restrictions kind of curtail Absolutely. a bit, he will, he will be on the yeah. first flight to South Bend. Yeah, um, well, I think that and just yeah, and yeah. a final thing there, I think the other thing I would say is that healing doesn't come just physically. Um, individually and in our marriage, we've experienced such profound emotional, spiritual, psychological healing as we've continued to surrender that suffering uh, that yeah. you know, we long for the physical healing still, um, but, but there's been beauty growth. And, and as my spiritual director once told me, he said, it's very likely that this sword that's piercing your heart is what will actually bring you to holiness. Yeah. He said, so let it transform mm -hmm. you, not deform you, which I really appreciated. So. That's yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic line. Um, and, and it rings true. I, um, yeah, I, I, I think the idea of cleaving to the cross, um, you know, it, one, it resonates very deeply at a school um, founded by the Congregation of Holy Cross. Um, uh, and, and it also reminds me um, in a very inter-Catholic ecumenical sense of the the Sushipe prayer uh, that came out of kind of the, um, I, you know, basically Ignatian spirituality and St. Ignatius where it would be basically pray like, Lord, take my liberty, my memory, my understanding and my entire will, all that I have and, and like call my own, you know, my, my own faculties. You know, you've given it all to me, to you I return it, give me only your love and your grace, that's enough for me. I mean, that's a really, right. yeah. It, it, it sounds like a very floral, fun prayer. It's actually incredibly <laughs> intimidating, right? It's like, oh, no, that, I, is, I, that is boot camp prayer right there. Don't, <laughs> don't take those things from me, man. Like, you know, I don't, you know, but I, I think that's the kind of, uh, the, the kind of spiritual insight that's required to really embrace the cross, which mm -hmm. is our only hope um, in a way in which it brings about our sanctification. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive because uh, uh, the, there's so much in modern culture that elevates kind of our, our freedom, our autonomy, our mm -hmm. faculties, our, our ability to control and, and master our surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's kind of a, um, it's, it's not a bait and switch, but it's counterintuitive to the modern mind. And I would even argue the modern Catholic mind to a certain extent to say uh, it's actually in in letting go that we're made capable to receive um, right. and so anyway right. but yeah I mean, no that's um you know yeah. we, we ask god to move and yet so many times we've packed our schedules we've packed our our plans so much that he's like in what space yeah. you know like yeah. would love to work a miracle would love to you know this is how i view it you know it's more like i have to just surrender that and so you were talking about that that prayer I, for me it's always been a litany of surrender and it's not a formal mm -hmm. one it's just presenting my desire to the Lord and saying like, my desire to be a mother, Lord, I surrender it. Like my fear of the future and, and the unknown of what will come, Lord, I surrender it. And oftentimes I'll just add Jesus, I trust in you right underneath that, right? It's like, Lord, I surrender it, right. Jesus, I trust in you. And it's a way to take that narrative that we often hear in our brain, like I'm not enough, I, I, I can't make it, like others are better than me, you know, whatever. All these things, like you just, you surrender it. You say, Jesus, I trust right. in you. Like, 
Jesus take yeah, the wheel. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They should write a song about that. Um, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I want to dig a little bit at this uh, line of thinking about vocation to love, but also want to get a little bit more specific about the program that you help sponsor and really run through the Soren Fellows program. Um, you know, broadly focuses on discernment and 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 habits of, of, of prayer, but discernment not necessarily not, not just in the sense of like, am I called to marriage or am I called to religious life? These kind of what we would consider like larger vocational mm -hmm. kind of questions, but mm -hmm. that daily vocational response of issuing that that fiat. Mm -hmm. And I think of it like in, in this academic year, in these times of COVID where there's much more significant social isolation and just, I, I, I think, you know, uh, we, we have to sit with ourselves so much more that issuing that daily fiat is is something that's, that's more difficult. Um, you know, in your experience running this this group and and working with these amazing holy women, you know, what, what have been some of the the insights that 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 you've gleaned as a community into like what really tills the soil to be able to issue that that da daily fiat, especially in the midst oh. of the kind of gunk that we're in. Oh, that's good, and I hope <laughs> I would love to get the girls to respond to some of this too. <laughs> you know, because it's an interesting question. Um, we come back a lot to the importance of personal prayer time. Uh, I hound them probably every week. I'm like, make sure you're starting your day with 15 minutes of prayer, at least. You know, you're, you're in the, if you're in the halls on campus, you have the Eucharist in your house. Like, do you know what I would give to have the Eucharist in my house? <laughs> you know, and, and, and so there's no reason wherever you are, if you're, even if you're just in your bed, but to start the day not looking at our phones, but to, with intentionality to come before the Lord and commit this day, like, um, and to start from there, because if our first marching orders are from our social media feed, it becomes harder to hear the Holy Spirit, right? Like if the first thing we're doing is like, oh, what happened last night while I was sleeping? Instead of like, come Holy Spirit, you know, help me to love and serve you and make you known, loved and served, right? Very different approach. And it's not always easy. And, and I'm not perfect at it either. But we talk a lot about um, 15 minutes at least to start the day. Uh, weekly adoration, again, a time to go to sit and and see and be seen by love mm -hmm. himself right in a way that like nobody can tell you exactly what you're supposed to do with your life except the lord so it would probably be good to cultivate some one-on-one -on -one time i mean you know when we think about that in our human sense like we we find mentors in our field or we find like i i loved hanging out with families before we were married i just wanted an immersion you know apprenticeship in the family we do that on a human level why don't we make more time to hear like the creator of our entire being who knows the plans he has for us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes we just have to check it <laughs> real quick, just do a quick reality check and say, but what am I actually doing? How am I spending my time? Uh, yeah. So we've talked a lot about that. Abandonment to divine providence comes mm -hmm. back a lot. Uh, we've read Jean-Pierre de mm -hmm. amazing work, um, Abandonment to Divine Providence. And again, that concept of letting God write the story um, different saints have made, made themselves known to us, you know, and I think we, we've realized that we're not expected to, to befriend every single saint at every single moment in time, but moreover, these are intercessors who come alongside us at certain moments in our story. Uh, and so individually, we've seen that happen, but also as a group, we've seen that happen. Like it's always been very clear which saint is presenting him or herself, like wanting to come along with us right now, you know, so um, we spent uh, the fall with St. Therese, and that was absolutely lovely. And we're actually moving into Our Lady here for the spring semester um, and some fun things coming, uh, which I will not divulge yet. But, um, you know, yeah, we, talk, we just talk a lot about that. And we just share the joys. We, we look at what's good, what's true, what's beautiful. And I think that's how we're going to get through the uncertainty of where we're at and where we go, right? Is we don't know. None of us know on a good day what's going to happen. And so right. it's to cultivate that spirit of attuning our, our heart and our mind to the Lord's voice for our own individual, if you will, directives, for lack of a better word, because yeah. yours are different than mine that are different than anybody else's. Um, and so we yeah. sit there and normally we would have everything already figured out. We'd have our plan and we know, you know, our four year curriculum and what classes we're taking and what fellowships and internships. And like, you've got this plan. And I, yeah, I sort of bucked the system a little bit and I'm like, eh. <laughs> yeah. Love it. You know, Love I it. mean, yes, yes. But don't be so wedded to your plans that you're not available to God, you know? 
Um, absolutely. It's both. Absolutely. No, no, totally. I, I, I think it's, I mean, in the context of, you know, just speaking for my particular position, like in context of student formation, we, we like to be able to, I like to be able to imagine that I have the levers and pulleys to manipulate, you know, someone from a freshman into a senior who's ready to go to law school and, you know, get at it or whatever. But really, if, if you don't have that, that backbone, that, that spiritual backbone of a very vibrant interior life that's, you know, active in prayer and close to the sacraments, it's like your professional development, your intellect, your, your social skills, like those are all limbs that won't work if your backbone is broken. Um, and, and so that I, I think from, you know, a student formation perspective where we want to be very outcome driven with our, our students and our graduates, it's like, well, yes, but yeah. um, so long as that backbone is still attached, you know? Um, and, and so one, just thank you for the work that you do with our, our, our Soren fellows, um, mm -hmm. both through VTL and through uh, walking with them in, in marriage prep, um, even some Soren fellows who have married one another. Um, I know, and, we're, we're, and we're getting good. <laughs> add it up, add it up, man. Next, next um, student formation uh, group is the matchmaking, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've, I've, I've got the database. Um, well, Susie, thank you so much. And I, I'm not going to let you off the hook, though. I have one bonus question that no. I ask every, every guest. So you and your family are, are staples at the Nicholas Center tailgates um, oh, yeah. when we have tailgates. Um, uh, there are rumors that perhaps uh, there, there is someone who can play the bagpipes in your family and may make visits from time to time. Two now, um, believe it or not. We have two. two. Yes. Two. Yes. Oh my gosh. Can, the 10-year-old John Paul is up on pipes now. So that's amazing. That's amazing. We're getting duet um, now. <laughs> that's, that is the best. Um, but so hypothetically, you're, you're at a DeNicola Center tailgate. The bagpiping has, has ceased. Um, and you get to crack, crack open a cold one, a LaCroix or alternative adult beverage yep. um, with anyone who's ever lived, living or dead, anyone, personal, famous, whatever, who are you cracking open a cold one with and why? I can't even pretend like this takes a time to think about because it's just so obvious to me. Um, it, John Paul II, uh, without a hesitation, I obviously, Theology of the Body has been incredibly formative for me in my professional life and in my own personal life and in my marriage. Um, but I think above that, he, above most other witnesses we have in, in our modern day, was such a witness to hope and to love. I mean, even his own autobiography or his own biography was mm -hmm. called Witness to Hope, right? Um, but he had that ability to present truth and charity and to understand the human drama that existed between who we are and who we are called to be, and yet not push people on that journey like he, he he invited you in to the fullness of love that God the Father had for you and you just wanted to be with him and I would just oh I would love so much right now to know what he would have to say about so many things that we face um in 2020 2021 and you know how how would he approach it so um, without a doubt and, and we love skiing I mean so we come full circle absolutely. back to the top of the conversation absolutely. you know I I would absolutely love to just go you know ski with Papa someday so I would that have been amazing we'll do what we can on that but I feel as though right. the Saints visit VTL with some frequency so I think you're closer than yeah, you think but, we're good yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he might make an appearance absolutely. later this year we'll see <laughs> love it Love it. Susie, um, on behalf of the entire DeNicola Center, thank you for all that you do for our students, for people here on campus at our Vita Institute. Um, and I'll look forward to getting into a live Q&A with our students yeah, in, in short really order. So really thanks great. so much, Susie. All right. All right. Take care. Well, hey, everybody. Hope you're having a good night. Hi, Susie. Hello. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> Awesome. You're so articulate in our conversation. You're always articulate, but especially in that convo. That was awesome. That's great. I'm glad to be here. This is fun. This is awesome. Well, we have questions and you have answers. Um, and so uh, I think we can just lead off right away if, if that sounds yeah. good to you. That's awesome. Cool great. Okay. So um, questions about discernment, uh, you know, uh, question broadly of saying like, okay, discernment is a very popular term for people who are theologically minded to, to use. And I, I think kind of inside the club, we all get what it means, but what is it, what does it look like in, in working with young couples, uh, preparing for marriage and working with young women? Uh, what are, what are signposts of true discernment in, in our everyday life? A really good question to start with. <laughs> um, yeah. I think if we're looking at the overarching concept of discernment, it's going to be more 
you know, thinking with God's heart, thinking with God's mind. And, and obviously if he's created us and he knows what's best for us, then how do we bring ourselves to live in line with his plan? Um, so discernment would first of all, first and foremost be forming ourselves. And then second of all, discerning how we are called to respond in love. And, and I think as far as how do we know the will of God, right? That's the million dollar question that we're always praying about to know more. Uh, you know, I'm always telling that folks, it's like, well, at least it has to be in keeping with the faith, right? We have these, these beautiful tenants that keep us on track, but you know, does it come from a multiple, a variety of sources? You know, do you see this, this, this concept coming back again and again, is it confirmed in numerous different ways? Um, is there a sense of peace that comes with it? Not condemnation, not fear, you know, but, but, but does it dwell, you know, peacefully within your soul? Um, and, and I think, through that, you start being able to discern through different choices. Um, in the School of the Holy Spirit, another Jacques Philippe book, um, which we, you know, obviously gave a plug for him in the interview. But I, I think there's a beautiful outline on how to discern the will of the Holy Spirit there as well. And this is just great practical advice that we use, you know, on a daily basis. Like, you know, all the yeah, all the no, big decisions in life. Like, how do I know the will totally. of God? Like, what am I supposed to do with my life? What am, what's my vocation? Who am I supposed to marry? Where should I get a job? Go to grad school? You know, all of those things. So yeah, yeah. On, on a on a big scale, I would say you know those are my thoughts on discernment. Did, did you mean yeah. specifically in in like relationships too, or just? No, I, yeah, I I think okay. just broadly. I, yeah. I don't think it has to be couched within relationships. Um, but yeah, yeah, but I, I yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say in the School of the Holy Spirit, Jacques Philippe is a fantastic resource, you know, if, if someone wanted to form themselves more. Yeah, totally. Uh, just to kind of second that, I, you know, even reflecting personally with respect to my discernment, which is ongoing, it's like we don't have to start from square one. We don't we don't have right. to rely only on our experience, only right. on our intellect or intuition or whatever grace is allotted to us. I mean, it's it's one of the beauties of having the life of the church and that you don't have to do that in an isolated way. And like you said, we have these kind of... Um, pillars uh, to kind of frame frame our thought the church fathers you know uh, mystical theology it's really yeah we don't have to start from square one which is a, i think a really important thing to be reminded of we have another question um you know from, from an underclass you know what kind of tangible experiences should i intentionally seek out in my college experience in order to be to be formed in my vocation oh well if you're a woman i would say join vocation to love because we're happy happy i would I used to say happy little sisterhood but it's a growing sisterhood and it's wonderful you know not everybody can make it each week but it is wonderful um you know intentional experiences i this might sound cheesy but the very first thing i would say is actually have us have a sabbath like that sounds crazy because i think you ask these questions you're like what club should i be involved in you know like what organization should i be a part of and i'm like no like actually just have a sabbath you know whether that's sundown saturday to sundown sunday whether it's all day sunday whatever it is cease work and just rest you know we, we think that the sabbath is optional it's actually a commandment right and and those that there's a growing group of us on campus that are trying to encourage each other to shut down the work, get the, get the assignments done, get everything done. So we really can just rest. And the joy that's coming from that is amazing. Right. And so that's when those relationships are built. That's when, um, you know, you have that time to come alive with what you're interested in doing and, and, and what you would like to pursue versus what's on your agenda for the next thing. That's when you have time for either, you know, for us as a family, just to have family time or just to catch up with a friend in the dining hall or in one of the lodges, you know, now. Um, so I'd say the Sabbath, um, to the extent that's possible now, immerse yourself in the families that are around here. There are so many amazing families that love having students join them. Um, you know, we're not doing as much normal as we normally would, but still virtually, you know, happy to do that as well. Um, mm. Being outdoors, just um, listening to the stories of others and letting them form you. Um, yeah. I, mm. I think we have such a, a great intellectual gift on this campus, but sometimes we find it as almost arguing our point versus trying to understand the perspective where someone mm. else comes from. Um, and so I think this is a gift and a time to listen um, and not to lecture, but to try to, to listen and to understand um, where mm -hmm. they're coming from. Obviously, to exchange your own thoughts as well, but not just to enter into everything as a, as a debate. Um, mm -hmm. And then just to give, your, give of yourself, you know, whether it's on campus or in the community, you know, wh whatever your gifts are, 
that that continual practice of making a gift of yourself in your halls, you know, in your classes, in your clubs, um, or even in the community, volunteering in some capacity in the community, I think that gives meaning to life and honestly grounds us outside of our ivory tower um, in the world in which we're going to live. Like we're only gonna be here for a certain amount of time. So we wanna make the most of it, but we also wanna stay grounded in, in what life will be like after, after campus life. Absolutely. I, I love that Sabbath. Well, I'm going to steal that. Um, that well, that is, started uh, when we were in the Holy Land. There you go. I'm there you go. So all, I'm, I'm still using electronics and, and you know, computers <laughs> and the like if need be. So I'm yeah. not quite there, but, but we really are trying to even fast from technology for the most part in the family. Yeah, totally. It's yeah, that's right? that. And yeah, and it's it is a commandment. It's not a it's not a suggestion. You know, it's not a spiritual self help tool. Like it, is, it is a commandment. Though. Yeah, I mean, totally. Right no, absolutely. There, Thou shalt not kill, and yet we're like, yeah. eh, well, I've got yeah. work to do. You know, yeah. house. So, it's a victimless crime. You know, That's yeah, right. no, exactly. exactly, exactly. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Susie. Um, I have a question from Natalie, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit here. Sure. Um, so I hope she doesn't mind. Um, so church teaching, especially with respect to like sexuality and morality, is often perceived and articulated in in the negative, in, in negative language. Don't do this. Thou shall not this. Don't, you know, wait, you know, whatever. Uh, how can we who, who believe these things to be true help speak to others who may not believe church teaching on this or may misunderstand it? You know, how do we effectively flip the language from thou shall not or don't do this to to be fully alive, do yeah. do this, and both on a spiritual level and on like a physiological level. Yeah. It, and it comes right back to what we sort of talked about already is that it has to come back to relationship and it has to come back to living it out, not, not this debate and this, well, I have a stronger intellectual case. I mean, clearly we are a subset of pe beings that like to, you know, chew on the good academic meat and potatoes, and I'm not denying us that. But at the same point, the Catholic faith at its core is a passionate desire of God for union with us, right? And in our quest for that deepest satisfaction and our deepest longings that are only going to be found in union with him. So if we get away from the relationship, if we don't let that dwell richly within us, then we're missing the whole point, quite honestly. And then the faith becomes incomprehensible and quite honestly, pretty meaningless because it's just another list of regulations. And well, who has the authority to make that? And quite honestly, who wants to be in a relationship where it's completely bound by a list of rules? Like, I don't like that. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Good. Like, I don't, I would never have dated my husband if he's like, okay, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. You must do this. Like that would not work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, it has to be about relationship and how we're best going to turn that tide is by the witness of our own life is by loving people genuinely, not loving them hoping we can change them, but l truly being Christ to them and uh, preaching the gospel at all times when necessary using yeah. words. I mean, that comes to mind as well. Um, but I think as we, as we celebrate life, as we witness our own vibrant relationship with the Lord, that type of, of personality draws others, right? Like you think, mm -hmm. of, again, I said, I would you know, have a beverage with John Paul II, but that that's why, right? He was he was just, his personality drew people to him that he could be ecumenical. He could unite very different ideologies, you know, because people could see he was madly in love with our Lord and lady. And so I think the more we form ourselves in holiness, the more we focus on relationship, then we do realize that our entire vocation is to love and to return that love back to God, the father. And this is what that looks like to love as he loved us. And then you unpack the teachings and every teaching comes yeah. back to that. Every single teaching of the church that I can think of right now comes back to how we as human beings return the love of God, the father that has been so lavishly poured out on us. Why yeah. wouldn't we do it? Love it. You know, love it. <laughs> no, I, I uh, so appreciate that. And it reminds me of a quote that father John Paul Kimes, a, a fellow Vita yeah. Institute faculty member and, and law school professor here. Um, at the Vita Institute, uh, maybe two years ago, uh, we were, I think, talking about kind of the philosophical arguments for or against abortion. Uh, and so it was pretty like heady 
heady stuff. You know, it was like intellectual and something that you could dialogue with, with someone who does not share your faith commitments. Mm -hmm. And the question came up of like, okay, well, how, wh what do you do when you place all these philosophical intellectual arguments that are rigorous in front of someone and yet they still, for one reason or another, just d will not kind of, um, uh, kind of recognize its persuasiveness it's it's well yeah it's persuasion i guess and he said he kind of paused and someone asked that and he goes become their friend you know um yeah. if, if, if you get to like an intellectual impasse and sometimes that that will happen i think universities are a good lab in which that happens but they aren't the exclusive place where that happens um uh, that friendship kind of wins wins the day and it kind of gets at these like transcendental ideas of goodness truth and beauty that those actually serve as i want to say like trump cards to the intellect but they're like the fullest expression expression of the intellect and that is what really will draw someone who's otherwise intellectually pigeonholed somewhere that, that they've dug their heels in is that if you give them those kind of glimpses of goodness truth and beauty in your own humble simple way um, that's eventually what kind of begins to like not chip away, but reform, remold the intellect that kind of then opens up to that rational art argumentation. Anyway, that's my TED talk. Well, absolutely, um, but, you're, uh, you're celebrating who that person is, right? You're celebrating their gifts. When you become a friend, it's not just about what can I get out of this, which wouldn't be appropriate. It's really giving of yourself, right? Again, practicing that sincere gift of self, but it's also celebrating those characteristics within the other person. You see Christ within them. And it changes everything. I mean, if we're, if we're only friends with people that think exactly like us, oh, it's going to be a real rough existence this side of heaven, you know? That's right. That's right. That's right. It's the mystery of the one and the many and the kind of the diversity that can be present within the contours of the faith. It's really beautiful. Um, a quick question uh, from Mary, which is a, a very short and fun question. Uh, fun date ideas during quarantine. <laughs> Oh man, um, <laughs> good date ideas. I, you know, I think it would be dependent on how seriously someone was dating. Um, mm. There's a book that I recommend couples read. It, it doesn't have to be during engagement; like they could just. But, but I would say it's, it's fairly seriously discerned, you know, relationship, um, which is a Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Auken, mm. and it, it, I love that book so much because it talks about it was a pretty good, decent pagan marriage as they would have called it, but how Christ redeemed it um, and how, you know, that love was transformed. Um, so doing that, um, I think, geez, that's a really good question. A because good there's yeah. not a lot, you know. know exactly. um, if you get onto formed.org, there is mm. a really good series um, called Beloved that's on mm. there. Um, and there are, I want to say 12 episodes with discussion questions on it on the sacrament of marriage. So if someone's discerning marriage and is at that point, then certainly, you know, you could watch that in the security and safety of your own dorm room, <laughs> you know, um, and then, you know, have a conversation about it. It is hard. I would say get outside, go enjoy nature, yeah. you know, uh, even in the winter, you know, St. Patrick's Park, you can go cross country ski, just go yeah. do something. Beats, um, uh beats watching office reruns. Um, so those are still great. Well, um, but but it, yeah. yeah, and I mean, you have to have some fun and you know, just the frivolous yeah. fun too. And I think that's one of the things I see on our campus that sometimes dating gets so serious so quickly. Yeah. And I'm like, just go have fun. Like, can you have fun together too? Absolutely. You know, you just like Absolutely. Let out and you know, what kind, if you're going to watch Netflix, what are you going to watch on Netflix? Yeah. You know, that's right. that's things right. like that, yeah. but yeah. It's a great question. Let me think. Great. I'll have to think about that and see. If yeah, I, no, that's it's, get a follow a up one. on that. It's a really good one. Um, There's a great question book called, uh, called from Eight Sarah. Dates, actually, um, John Gottman wrote this book, and it's called Eight Dates. I've got it on my shelf. I'm just trying to figure out if that would be applicable for for a discerning relationship, or would be better, you know, for a um, couple already married. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Let me let me think about that one. Yeah, absolutely, that's a great question. Um, paraphrasing a question from from Sarah and I, I hope uh, she doesn't mind me paraphrasing um, what role does retrospect play in discernment looking backwards at certain experiences yeah. in your life um, can we see God and God's presence looking backwards even when in that moment to which we are looking we did not recognize God's presence within it and what role does that play in in discernment, and I, I think maybe part of what Sarah might be getting at is how do you, what are the limits of being able to discern the presence of the Lord in in the present, and what role then does yeah. looking back 
uh, play in kind of peeling back the layers of the onion. So when I was an undergrad, there was a book called Experiencing God that I read, and I was Protestant at the time. My church did this, and there was a workbook that we went through. And it was it was a very moving experience for me. I, I don't even know if the book's still in print at this point. But one of the things they talked about was how in the Old Testament, every time there was this encounter with God, they would build this pillar, right? Like they would build these the stone pillars. Like here, in this moment, there was this encounter with God. And then you'd go further, you know, along in history. And then there, here's this next pillar. And, and I remember very specifically this discussion about like, if you were to sort of plot out those pillars of your own life of faith, your own experience, you know, with any part of the Trinity, then once you see those, it, it sort of forms a trajectory. Um, and, and that was the point that it made. It's like, God is not going to go here and be like, oh, just kidding. We're going to really go way over here. Even in my own story, you know, with all of my different studies and everything, all my interests, like they, they did actually lead to the fulfillment and like where I am even now and that, and that trajectory keeps on continuing. Um, and so I think what was helpful for me as an undergrad was to plot out, if you will, where my faith pillars were mm. and then sort of draw the arc like you had used to have to do you know in algebra two you had to like plot your little marks and then you know draw your <laughs> your prediction line all of that and it's like okay then what does that look like in the life of faith yeah uh, and where might might be going um you know certainly you know certainly there can be surprises you know from now and then but i in, in most cases for others that i know definitely in my own life it very much has been part of that that arc or that curve in the same direction yeah, uh, thanks for sharing that. That uh, and that's something that that resonates with me. There, there is, yeah, the, it is true that that the Lord can be a Lord of surprises. Um, uh, sometimes that says more about us than it does about the Lord. Um, and so there, yeah, there is a helpful like spiritual kind of plot point plotting uh, that 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 is really helpful to do. And and there are vagaries uh, uh, to even our own discernment in the present, or even looking in retrospect. And I always fall back on this. Oh man, I, I can't really tell like it's kind of gray you know like a lot of life is gray not black and white what is black and white though um i, I thought about this a lot in grad school and we we're thinking like different conceptions of justice and and who is you know who is the aggressor here here who is at fault who is who needs to be kind of justified um and they get really complex and convoluted and just like i don't know everything's kind of gray the one thing that isn't gray uh are the sacraments right it, it's just like there there are certain things that are not subject to interpretation. Um, and there, there are certain things that will always be pillars and that will always be clear. And so though in the life of discernment, there may be more gray than black and white, there, there are still black and white pillars of the life of the church, of the lives of the saints and, and of the sacraments. So I always find that to be a very helpful thing to follow. And we're not so powerful. That, I mean, we think we're so powerful that we, that we can screw up the plans of God. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I truly believe that if we are willing, if our intentions are properly placed, if we are seeking to be in a state of grace and we're giving our continual fiat, I, I, my perception of the Lord is sort of like, yeah, I can work with that. You know, like it, it's not going to be like that we have somehow failed and we have just messed everything up and we have just ruined his entire plan for our life. Yeah, totally. Not, not so. <laughs> I think... Honestly, it sounds maybe weird. I think that's a great place in this Lenten context for us to kind of pause um, and for me to say thank you, Susie, for um, both for tonight and for our conversation, but of course for everything that you do and have done and will continue to do, God willing, for our, our soaring yeah, fellows absolutely. and for Notre Dame. We're a better place because you're here, Susie, so oh. thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm thankful to be here. I love this. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, best wishes for the rest of VTL this semester, and we'll look forward to when we can gather in person sometime soon again. That would be wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Susie. Have a great night. Good night, everybody. All right.